How is everybody this afternoon? Good. Uh, on behalf of the National Park Service, I'll say we're so grateful uh, that you're here. We're very grateful that you're here in person. Uh, for those of you watching online, thank you for carving out some time in your day to uh, participate in this installment of the Winter Lecture Series. As you look around, it, it may not look like it, but we're actually at capacity today, uh, given our COVID protocols. So this is um, the first time that's happened since we've re-inaugurated these series. So again, very, very grateful to you all. And I'm uh, most especially grateful to our guest for uh, this installment of the Winter Lecture Series, Ty Sigley. Uh, I'm going to read your CV, sir, to inter uh, introduce okay. you here, so I want to be accurate. Um, Dr. Sigley is a Brigadier General, retired of the United States Army, where he served nearly four decades, including um, in locales such as Kosovo, Saudi Arabia, Iraq, and many, many others. He is um, currently the professor of, excuse me, the Chamberlain Fellow at Hamilton College in Clinton, New York. Prior to that, he served a distinguished career as a professor of history at the United States Military Academy at West Point. Uh, most importantly, he's here today because he is the author of this book, Robert E. Lee and Me, A Southerner's Reckoning with the Myth of the Lost Cause, which was published in 2020, I believe, so last year. Uh, I will also add that he has been incredibly generous with his time. Uh, with his expertise. He actually left early to be here so he didn't get caught in the snow somewhere in upstate Pennsylvania. So um, on that note, please join me in welcoming Dr. Thank Ty you. Sigley. Thank you. What I, what I thought we would do this afternoon is have a fairly informal conversation about not just your book, but your experience growing up in the South, your identity as a Southerner, a scholar, a soldier, and how that led to the creation of Robert E. Lee and me. Um, and I, I'd like to begin, uh, General Sigley, the same way that you begin the book. And that's in 2015 with a, a video that you do for PragerU. And PragerU is a, a right-leaning social media content producer, I guess is the best way to describe it. And you do a short five-minute video for them about the causes of the American Civil War. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Great, well, Chris, thank you for having me and thank for the Gettysburg Foundation for supporting me and, uh, and thank all of you for coming. This is like my second in-person book talk, uh, even though the book's been out a year. So it's great to see everybody. Thank you so much for coming. So I, uh, yeah, in 20, I guess it was 2014, we had a book come out, The West Point History of the Civil War, and I was doing some publicity for that. And I did some radio interviews, and, and the, the publicist came and said, hey, they, they want you to do a video on the cause of the Civil War. And I said, well, easy peasy. Uh, but can I, you know, do I have complete uh, control of what I can say? And so I went on the site, and I looked at a few history ones, and they said, you know, there was somebody on there, a uh, 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 historian uh, slash priest from Notre Dame who said that, that you know, the bomb, uh, talked about the, the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So I said, okay, I can do this. Uh, and I did it in late 2014, but, you know, they had these swooping graphics and everything else, so it didn't come out until a month or two months after the massacre of black churchgoers in Charleston by a white supremacist. So what I thought was just, and I did it in my blue army uniform. I didn't think anything of it, but you know, when I started it, I said that the, you know, was there, why is this a controversial statement? It's because the citizens of the Southern states uh, in, in 1860 and 61, uh, were willing to fight and die to preserve the morally repugnant institution of slavery. And there really is no other cause. It's, you know, it's like great real estate, right? There are three reasons for great, that, that's a real estate price. It's location, location, location. And the reason for the Civil War is slavery, slavery, slavery. So I said this, but what I didn't realize was that, uh, holy cow, did it start a firestorm. So it went viral. Turns out the Army does not like officers going <laughs> viral. Uh, and, and this is not like, so the Army investigated me for political speech for saying the Civil War was about slavery. Uh, I, the, the things had like 30 million views now, and, and I got hate, not only did I get hate mail to my West Point public email address, I got death threats to an army officer for saying that, that uh, the Civil War was about slavery. And there was another, there's a whole website making fun of my looks, which my son found and, uh, and sent to me. It turns out that, uh, that uh, I have a face made for radio. As the great Fred Allen once said, yes. Uh, and, it, and as the jokes went, uh, you know, that we really know there are aliens because uh, they, 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 they really, you know, the area that 51 is real because the feds failed to lock the gate or this guy, 
That's one good one. The other one is that guy doesn't have a four head, he has a five head. <laughs> so what I realized from this though, after all the jokes and everything and, and being investigated, I thought my, my army career was over, is that history is dangerous. It's dangerous because it goes after our myths and our identities. And when somebody, somebody goes after that myth and challenges it, the reaction can be ferocious. So when the things that you said on that video, they're not necessarily new ideas, right? I mean, many, many scholars for decades have been saying the same thing. Why do you think it struck such a nerve when you did it, though? Was it, was it the Army uniform, or was it the fact that, you know, here's a white guy saying it? Uh, yes, above. Yes to all of above. So I think it, it mattered that uh, the timing mattered a month after the Charleston massacre. I think it mattered that I was uh, a middle-aged white guy. Uh, I think it mattered that I was in my blue army uniform uh, as a colonel in the army at the time. Uh, it mattered that I was associated with West Point. Uh, and it mattered that I wasn't some you know, liberal uh, professor at some kind of saying that this. It was, this was, and I provided cognitive dissonance for people, I think, when I did this. So I think that's why it did it. And then, and then, um, and I also think it, that, uh, you know, I think the language is strong. It's just, I didn't, there, there, I broke no, there, it's just, this is definitely what it is. So, yeah, and it, it, people weren't ready to hear that, many people. Besides the investigation that the Army conducted into you, was there any other fallout from that professionally, from the military? Yes. I, I, well, I mean, the Nation, wrote, which is a left-leaning organization, yeah. said I was a propagandist for the military. Uh, Stars and Stripes said that I was too close to a right-wing political organization. Um, and, and it certainly, it, at West Point, my, my bosses there uh, looked at me like I was a, a troublemaker, you know. So, yeah, it, it was, it, it did, certainly did not help me in my Army career. What, was it that experience that was the, the impetus for you to go ahead and write this book? Well, I think there's a couple of, of reasons for that. The, that's a great, so the first one is, um, I, the, the, another, I'm a historian, so I can't say yes or no, no yes or no answers today. It's always a story. And the story is, so I was chair of the Memorialization Committee at West Point, and we, we were really reeling from the 100 graduates who had died in the War on Terror from, Af from uh, West Point. And just to put that in context, in Yale, uh, in World War I, had 100, had, had 10 times the number of casualties uh, killed in World War I than West Point did. Uh, in the War on Terror, they had, West Point had uh, over 100 killed, Yale zero. So we were really feeling the effects, and there wasn't one place to put them. So as chair of the Memorialization Committee, I had this idea that in our memorial hall, we'd put one room that had the list of those who, as Lincoln would say, gave the last full measure of devotion from the War of 1812 through the War on Terror. So I got all that ready, got the money, got the design, we knew where it was going to go, but one thing was a problem. Should those who, who were in Confederate gray, West Point graduates in gray who died for the Confederacy, go in the memorial room at the United States Military Academy. And I argued strenuously, vociferously, no, because they abrogated their oath, they killed U.S. Army soldiers, they fought against their country to destroy their country for the worst possible reason, to create a slave republic. And if that wasn't enough, the purpose of the building the, was the anti-Confederate George Washington Cullum gave the money for this, he was superintendent of West Point during the war, and, and said, I will never forgive those who forgot the flag to follow false God, and the law says no unworthy subject should go in there. Uh, so I slam dunk. So I go in there to talk to the assorted uh, people on the academic board who look mainly like me, um, at, at, this is West Point's sort of decision-making body, and say, here's my, give all that argument. Man, back, 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 back. I was like a machine gun of facts. You know, I talk fast, I get it all out. And, and they said, no, we want to bring people together. We, we don't want this to be like the Sunni and the Shia fighting for centuries, which is the worst historical analogy in the history of the world, I might add. Uh, and I lost. So they voted to put them in. Now, eventually, things happened. They, they ended up not doing it. So I went tail between my legs back to talk to my wife, Sherry, who's in the audience here today, and said, Sherry, I had this brilliant argument about why Confederates shouldn't go in. And they didn't listen to me. She said, well, Ty, did you tell them why you're so passionate about this? Did you tell them your story? I said, no, 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 no. I did not tell them my story because historians tell other people's story. They don't tell their own. And so what she did was say, listen, if you're going to be honest about this, you got to tell your own story. And that's what I eventually did uh, at Washington at least. So the idea of this really came uh, because I was unsuccessful getting the facts straight any other way except telling it through my own story. So you mentioned Washington and Lee, and I want to, I want to get there in a little mm -hmm. bit. But I want to start off with your story a little bit earlier. And you have a line in the book uh, saying that you, know, you grow up in Alexandria, Virginia. You consider mm -hmm. yourself a Southerner. Right. Even though I think some today would argue about whether or not Alexandria is actually the South. <laughs> but um, you say growing up on a scale of, you know, the spinal tap scale of 1 to 10. Right, right. Robert E. Lee's an 11. 
and Jesus Christ is about a five. Right. So can you go? Can you go in? Can you explain that for us? Yeah, yeah. So I, I grew up on the on the. So Alexandria. Um, remember, it it uh, you know it, it used to be part of D.C. up until 1847. When it retroceded, it left D.C. in 1847 to protect the slave trade. Alexandria in the 1950s. So it it was the major slave trading hub uh, in northern in northern Virginia in that Maryland D.C. area. Uh, in the 1950s, it passed a law to name every north south street after a Confederate as a reaction to integration. Uh, so uh, when when I was I was bused across town from the black school white school Douglas MacArthur to the segregated black school what was the name of the segregated black school Robert E Lee Elementary so this was the outpost of the bird machine the massive resistance was in Alexandria so every part of my life didn't make me think that Lee was good it was reverential that was what the the southern and remember when I say southerner the white is usually silent southerner the white is silent so it's a white southern culture. But often we say Southerner and we leave the white part out because remember, 30 to 40 percent of the of South is black Americans. But it was reverential. So whether it was at Episcopal High School, which had we knew that descendants of Lee were there. It had a big monument to Confederates there. The, the big prize was after that. The, the, the headmaster that was there was a grandson of a Confederate veteran. It, the Confederacy was the, they were the, the noble. They lost, but they were noble. So, yeah, every part of my life and my dad used to say, you know, our, our funny last name, uh, Sigley. He would say, yeah, my name is Jim Sigley. Uh, uh, that rhymes with Robert E. Lee, my hero. So uh, we had, I had the Confederate flags above the mantelpiece. So certainly in my life, uh, among the white Southerners that I knew, Lee was the paragon. He was, it was reverential. Jesus was somebody you had to go to see, talk to on Sunday, you know. <laughs> I mean, I had to go to church on Sunday, but Lee was the, he was who you wanted to be. And your birthday is? Oh, my birthday is July 3rd. Anybody, maybe, maybe, maybe some people in the audience know <laughs> that July 3rd has a meaning here at Gettysburg. So yeah, I, 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 mean, I wanted to be born on 4th of July, an all-American boy, uh, but I was so close. But then I found out that, that Pickett's Charge was that day. I'm like, ah, here's, here's something. I'm linked to Lee now. And even though, I mean, Pickett's Charge is not a military success, as, as we would say, you still connected with Lee because of the fact that your birthday happened to fall on Yeah, this was so crazy about Pickett's charge. I mean, it's a suicidal charge, right? I mean, it's an it's a absolute disaster. Um, and yet, you know, Burnside gets just crucified for his disaster at Fredericksburg. Uh, Grant gets crucified for his disaster at Cole Harbor and even one, you know, at Vicksburg. So frontal assaults have a bad name when they don't work in the Civil War, but not this one. This one, all we were talking about is Lee accepting blame like a good gentleman. Uh, so yeah, even though even though it was a it was a disaster, this lost cause mythology really created that Lee was the gentleman. This was this whole idea of what a gentleman is, and I I tell you I have trouble describing myself as that anymore because it does have both uh, both racial and 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 misogynist undertones. Like the white gentleman is the top of the of the of the patriarchal class. It's the top up here, and everybody else is kind of below. And that's why I loved it. Why I love Lee. It's the, it's, the top, it's the most status uh, is attributed to him. You know, growing up, and you write in the book how this desire on your part to be this Southern Christian gentleman. Growing up, did you make those connections, or was it just this is what you know, a young yeah. boy growing up in Virginia is supposed to do? Does a fish know it's in water? <laughs> you know, I mean, it, it, was, it was the milieu that I was in that, that you wanted to be a gentleman. You wanted to be an educated Christian gentleman wearing a blue blazer and a rep tie and, and khakis and weegins, and you wanted that status. I wanted status, I wanted, and status is a form of power, you know? So yeah, I wanted that, I wanted that. I wanted, as a, as a young kid, I wanted, wanted status, and, and that was in my culture, that's where the status, that I saw anyway. Mm -hmm. That's where that, because I was, again, my dad was a, a teacher, prep school teacher, and the, the boys had that that were there, and the people that were there, that's, that's how they equated it, at least at Episcopal High School when I was growing up. So I got some images I'm going to share here if I can. No. So in the book, you mention a couple of texts that are very impactful to you at an early age. And one is Meet Robert E. Lee, and the other, and I pulled out a page from uh, one of the textbooks that you had, I believe in Alexandria. Yes. So when you see these, can you, can you go into that a little bit? Yeah, I sure can. So the one on your left uh, is the, so it, it, the seventh grade textbook for the state of Virginia. The state of Virginia created purposely 
um, that Harry, the bird machine, which controlled Virginia, is as part of massive resistance. Remember, Virginia led the league in massive resistance to integration. When 1948 came and Truman starts the Civil Rights Commission, based on, on, uh, on the lynching, particularly of, uh, of, of African-American uh, veterans, he starts that and, and the, the, the white South goes crazy about that. They just go insane. And Virginia wants to know, hey, are we making sure that we're, that we're teaching young white and black kids in Virginia that, that segregation is good? And the, only, and the best way to say segregation is good is, and this is a quote, can we make slavery look as good as possible? And so that's what the 4th, 7th, and 11th grade text that the state of Virginia uh, forces the schools to have. And the, the picture on the left is showing a, uh, a family that, is, that has just come off the Middle Passage from Africa, entering into what they call social security system. And what it's trying to show is that there, you can see the white colonial guy, hand on the shoulder, the woman, oh, thank goodness, someone's gonna take care of us. This is going into perpetual bondage for generation after generation, and it looks like they're, they're coming off a of Princess Cruise line. Um, that's what it looks like. And, and so the evil, and you can even see the white sailor with like a little tattoo on there. That's the low class, right? And, but the planner class, the, the, how erect he is, the clothes he's in, this is an educated Christian gentleman. That's what he's trying to show you. So this was the book that everybody in the South had through the 70s. Um, if you're in the state of Virginia, that's what it had. On your right is Meet Robert E. Lee, my favorite chapter book. And you'll notice in the upper right-hand corner, you'll see the little lion, the little step-up orange lion. Um, and if you open up the book, then it says uh, there's a second-grade teacher um, that says, hey, we love these because it's for inquiring minds. It's kids want to know more. And there's a little quote um, that says, I love them, from Steve Meyer, second grade Chicago. This was published a year after King's assassination, written, in fact, by a, a Harvard-educated Connecticut Yankee. But it says that Lee was the finest gentleman ever. He, he and Washington were the last men of old Virginia. And, and there were two African-Americans that are in these Picture. One picture, he is a, a coach driver, an enslaved driver, uh, one black man, and the, other, the others were crazed uh, uh, assassins during John Brown's raid. And those are the only two depictions on there. It wasn't anything about slavery. It's about Lee being the great gentleman. And I just, I, just, I just ate that stuff up. And so this, and then the third book would have been Gone with the Wind, which I read when I was in sixth, sixth grade, and I read it and read it again. And if you read it now, it is, it is just awful. It's just awful, the depiction of racism, of lost cause, um, of, of, uh, of just, uh, just, just horrible. And, uh, and that was, you know, those were the books that, that really meant a lot to me as a kid growing up. Did you have a lot of interaction? As you mentioned, you go to Robert E. Lee uh, School. Is it elementary? It's elementary, elementary yeah. Did you have a lot of interaction with black students, African-American students? Yes. Were you, were you silo? Yes. No, well, I think when I lived in, in Virginia, my last couple of years there, so my dad was there when we integrated uh, Episcopal High School. It was one of the last Episcopal schools to integrate in the country, uh, but it did in 68, 69. And so we had black kids uh, coming over to the house. I remember, you know, we would watch, uh, uh, you know, whatever the, 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 the good times one I remember watching with, with, uh, with, the, with the, they were a little bit older than me that would come uh, to our house. So, and I remember my dad coaching the black kids there, but, you know, it was pretty much tokenism that was coming there at Episcopal. And then I remember going to uh, Robert E. Lee. It's the only time in my life, I think, that I had a black teacher and a black principal was when I was in, uh, in at Lee Elementary School. And I ran for president that year in the school, and I lost 40 to 60%, 60% mm -hmm. black kids, 40% white. And then I became part of the, the white flight movement. So at, when I was in Georgia, when I lived uh, for high school, uh, uh, I did not realize it was 50% African-American in, in that town. Uh, the only time I, I saw black people was my summer job at an egg processing factory. Mm -hmm. And there I was one of the few white uh, 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 folks there. Uh, and of course, very few at Washington and Lee as well. It's in the army that we, you know, we really began to see uh, 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 black people as, 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 particularly, and in the army I had black bosses routinely. Mm -hmm. um, my last boss one before I left the army was a black boss. So I routinely had them in the army and I think that's part of what, what changed me. It's kind of a, you know, I don't know, it's probably a difficult question to answer, but did you consider yourself racist then? Oh, no, I would not have considered myself racist. Do you consider then. yourself, looking back on your experiences now, you say, oh, yes, I was. I was oh, I, I think, yes, I was. I, I think that, um, I mean, racism is the virus in the American dirt. It, it is our eternal pandemic. And so I think most people are affected by this unless you are actively working not to. It just, it just is, it is. And, of course, it's not just the South. 
you know, the most segregated cities in the country are now in the North and, and West. So, you know, that's what housing policy did by the Federal Housing Administration. Social Security excluded black people when it first started. VA loans, GI Bill, redlining, real estate agents. So I, I would not, if I, I mean, I didn't think I was at the time, but uh, looking back, my experiences were that I just, I did not, uh, I don't think that my culture embraced equality uh, as it should have. So ultimately, you go down to Georgia, and then you make the decision to go to Washington and Lee University right. for, for school. Can you give us some insight into, out of all of the places you could have gone, yeah. you know, bright young guy, you settle on Washington and Lee. Can you tell us a little bit about that decision? I'm still, still figuring that one out. Still figuring that one out. So I, uh, because I, I'm a straight guy, straight white guy going to an all-male school, the closest women's colleges are an hour away and I don't have a car. So it is, it is still all-male. No, it's not. It was when I was there. When, you attend, yeah. when I attended, it was all-male. And it was at its, it probably at its valley. It is a, it is a, a first-rate liberal arts college now. Really, really good. Uh, because it went co-ed a couple of years after I left. And it, you know, it's, it's got, it, it, but it was at its trough when I was there in the 80s. This was also the Animal House era. Fraternities era so strong, which is a, you know, not, I'm not a fan. Um, thank goodness we don't sort of have those at Hamilton College, uh, which is a jewel of a liberal arts school. Uh, little plug there for Hamilton College. Go Continentals. Um, uh, but, but I went there because I, I wanted to leave Georgia. I wanted to get out of the Deep South. I knew that rural Georgia was not me. Um, but where I, got, I looked at Duke, I looked at Davidson, I looked at Swanee, I looked at uh, um, you know all the places that a, a status-seeking white Southern kid would want to go to, and I, I went to W L and I, I saw that same status that I saw at Episcopal. Yeah. I saw the the, boy, the the young men dressed in the same way. It looked like almost like a collegiate terra, you know, with those big uh, the big the colonnade, the grass, and and the the, the, the young men who were talking to me. I thought here's status. I could mm -hmm. feel it there. So I went there, and, and the, the, the ideal of Lee, uh, it still appealed to me. This is, he's still there on that, on that uh, spinal tap scale, <laughs> still, still, still an 11 for me. We had um, Tony Horowitz, before he passed away. Oh, uh, gosh, yes. Here, to um, do something very similar. And, you know, in his book, Confederates in the Attic, Horowitz writes about how Richmond is kind of like the Confederate Mecca, but Lexington might be, you know, Medina. And I'd argue, I mean, I think Gettysburg is right up there, too. To yeah, right. no, I, I think you're right. Your time at... Washington Lee, though, did you find that to be the case? Oh, totally. You've alluded to it already. Yeah, totally. So if you go in at Lee Chapel, for instance, uh, uh, now, by the way, they just re, oh yeah, there it is. Well done. Nice. <laughs> Thousand bonus points. Uh, so if you look at that, um, so if you go into Lee Chapel, uh, it's, named, it's now a university chapel, they just renamed it, but then Lee Chapel, you go in there, and it is, it is, a, uh, it is, it is a shrine. It was the shrine of the South. That's what they called it. They used to have the, the bumper, the, uh, the, the, the license plate, Virginia license plate, if you lived in Rockbridge County, said Shrine of the South. That's what it used to say on there. And tourism was about this. Washington Lee called it the Westminster Abbey of the Confederacy. And if you go in there, it, it, I'm a raised Episcopalian. I know my way around a church. I was a head acolyte for two years. Uh, so I know my way. You go in there, and it looks like every chapel that's built in the 19th century or every church, Episcopalian church, um, except for a couple things. It's missing a pulpit. It's missing um, uh, uh, the, where the, the hymnals are laid. It's missing a couple of those things. But it has an apse. The apse is the holy of the holies. And it has an altar. Um, and in that altar is, it, on that altar is Robert E. Lee. In a, the white, is, why white? White for his purity. White for white, the, what he was fighting for, the white people of the South. And he's in his battlefield, he's in his uniform, uh, uh, asleep on the battlefield, not dead. He's buried below, and his hand is on the saber. And if you look right there, the seal is the seal of the state of Virginia. He belongs to the state. Um, and it is a holy place. And I knew people that were there that would go to genuflect before St. Bob if they had some problem that they were thinking about. Uh, there was a woman who got married there in the 90s that said, I chose it because it was the most sacred space I knew. It was sacred. And, uh, and so, yeah, it was, this, is, this was absolutely still General Lee's College. Mm -hmm. it, is, it was called, it was General Lee's College. That's the name of the history book about it, is General Lee's College. Um, the thing is now, it's not General Lee's College. I think it is fighting for, it, it's fighting for what does this school gonna mean now? And I hope it will choose that it's not General Lee's College because it's a fine institution now. But, but if you go in there, that, and, and I don't know if we wanna talk about that now, but that's where I was commissioned. Um, so, in fact, I received my commission. I took an, uh, I took an ROTC, scholar, ROTC scholarship because I was broke. My parents got divorced. I had no money. So I took one of these. They were giving them out like Pez um, uh, during the Reagan era. <laughs> Didn't want to go in. 
Army was for miscreants. That's what my family told me. But I, I didn't have any money. So, uh, uh, and it took me 36 years to get out. So I, I took, I, obviously, I, I, love, I love the Army. But so I went in there. There's a picture of me, back with hair, uh, waiting in my green uniform next to this beatified picture of Lee. And then I go get my commission right in front of this. Go back, and then I, I raise my right hand and give the oath of office. How many of you served in federal government or veterans have taken that oath of office before? Anybody ever taken that oath of office? Okay, I did too, to protect and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic, and bear true faith and allegiance to the same. Sound familiar? What I didn't realize then when I took those surrounded by Confederate flags is that oath was written in 1862. It is an anti-Confederate oath. When it says enemies, foreign and domestic, it's talking about Confederates. That used to be the ironclad oath. The ironclad oath, which, which is the first part was a background check. Were you ever with those traitorous Confederates? The last part, which we take today, um, was, the, was the promissory note. And in 1884, they got rid of the first part and kept the second part. So I took an anti-Confederate oath to serve the United States of America surrounded by Confederate flags. Did, did you recognize the irony of that at the time? Or is this only later that you? <laughs> Chris. I was honest. Chris. I recognize nothing. I thought it was absolutely appropriate. It was absolutely appropriate. America, this is great American. This is this lead, this great American. This person who is, uh, um, who is, who is a great military hero. And in fact, so if you write out here, if you imagine there and there, there's a picture of Lee in Confederate gray, and here's a picture of Washington in, in, British, in British red. It was his French and Indian War a picture. So neither one of them was in Army, uh, Army, the Army blue. Remember, the blue color that we wear that Ulysses S. Grant wore was chosen by Washington uh, because Washington was a clothes horse. He loved that blue. He, he chose blue for the U.S. Army, same blue he wore that Grant wore that I wore for, for nearly four decades. So, yeah, no, I had no clue that it, how ironic until I studied that oath, and then I went, oh, my God. I took an anti-Confederate oath surrounded by And wh why, when did those Confederate flags leave? 2014, because of the protests of black law students at WNL. You know, in part, I keep asking the question because I'm waiting for, you know, your moment of catharsis, right? Where yes. The light bulb turns on. Yes. Probably my favorite part of the book is when you bring your wife into Lee Chapel. Yes, yes. And you'll do a better job of telling that story, but she, she sees a very different thing when she looks at that yeah. statue of Lee. Yes. Can you go into that a little bit? Sherry, what, what did you say when you saw that? Get me out of here. Yeah. <laughs> So if, if they, I don't know if they heard, uh, heard it, but, but basically what she said is, get me out of here. Um, you know, her dad it went to VMI for a year and then went to West Point, graduated in 53. And his hero was George Thomas. He's a Virginian, was from Portsmouth and, and taught, he's, Sherry's one of five girls, and taught them that Lee was a, tra Lee was a traitor. Now, <laughs> how she was over, able to overcome that and marry me is a, is a, is a that's a, a topic for a different lecture, <laughs> a different time. But, but she certainly saw it. She said, get me out of here. And we went back later and, and with our kids. And she was still, I showed, because if you go down below in Lee Chapel, it's a, it's, a, uh, it's a reliquary. We were stationed in Naples for uh, two years, and we used to go to all these churches in Southern Park. And they had the bones to their saint, the remains of their saints. And there'd be these old men and women whispering prayers to them. And that's what Lee Chapel was like. It's a, you know, they had the, the Lee and Traveler sock puppets, you know, little finger puppets there. Traveler is buried outside. And Traveler buried outside, the, 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 the people still leave uh, apples and carrots on his ghostly voyage uh, with his master. And they bring, they put pennies. Why pennies? They put pennies face down on Traveler's grave so that the Lincoln will not, so that Lee can't see the hated Lincoln's face and so that Lincoln will have to kiss Traveler's butt. True story. So, so we haven't got there yet, but, but remember, oh, this, is, this all stuff has a pernicious purpose. There's a purpose to this stuff. There's a purpose. You graduate from Washington Lee. You're now in the United States Army. And you end up traveling the world, but you spend a, a number of time at various military bases, a large number of which are named for Confederate officers, a, a number who served at Gettysburg, so Benning, Fort Benning, Fort Hood, Fort Lee, Fort Pickett. Um, and, and there's a number of... United States military bases named after uh, I mean, Fort Gordon, named after John B. Gordon, who never actually even served in the United States military. As you're traveling around these bases, did that, you know, you write a lot about it in your book, but I'm wondering when you kind of connected the dots and were like, hey, that's kind of curious. Yeah, way too late, <laughs> way too late. The idea that, uh, that these people that we named them after were the enemy 
that uh, they were part of an insurrectionist force that killed U.S. Army soldiers. Um, they were part of a, a force that did not accept the results of a democratic election and chose armed rebellion instead. It didn't, it didn't penetrate for years, for decades even. I saw them as either, but, but what's interesting is you go to those places, and I was at Bragg, Benning, uh, particularly, the most of those, um, and you go there, they never tell you who they are. They never, there's no thing there that says, oh, here's who Bragg is. Because yeah. you can't. Who, could, who would you want, would you want to tell the story of Braxton Bragg? and try to inspire young soldiers with Braxton Bragg? <laughs> Would you want to tell the story of John Brown Gordon, who you know, shot five times at Antietam? I mean, yeah. a great soldier, no doubt about it, probably the, the best of the non-professionally trained soldiers, uh, certainly in the Confederacy, but also one who in 1868 uh, gave a talk to black Charlestonians. Uh, this is after the war and said, listen, uh, uh, black people of Charleston, if you demand equality, the 40 million of us white people will exterminate the 4 million of you in a race war. He led the Ku Klux Klan. Uh, he was a white supremacist governor and senator for the rest of his days. And this is who we named it for. The idea that we named them for the enemy, people that killed U.S. Army soldiers, is just outrageous to me. Uh, but I, I did not see that for a long, long time. And it's still, I think, a fairly contentious topic of debate, the renaming of these bases. It is contentious. From your perspective as both a scholar but also as a, you know, a member of the United States military, what is, what is the answer there? Do we rename the bases? Do yes. We, we do. Who, yes. Who, who do we name them after? Well, I mean, you know, there's a commission ongoing uh, that is, uh, 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 that I'm a member of, and I can't really talk much about that because of it's ongoing, but I can't tell you the law. The law said, uh, the National Defense Authorization Act of 2021 said, uh, create a commission and with the purpose of, of changing, modifying um, any uh, asset, uh, paraphernalia even, uh, that commemorates uh, uh, those who voluntarily serve in the Confederacy or the Confederacy. And, and then it gave till the end of 2022 to, uh, to uh, 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 September 30th of 2022 to come up with recommendations and then uh, told the Secretary of Defense to implement it by the end of 2023. Okay, so you think we'll see that within the next few years then? I do. Do you have any so it's idea? A law. It's a law. Without delving too deep into that, in, in various other interviews you've done in your book, you, you highlight some individuals that you think would be good representatives of where America currently is, what, what America should look like to be, to be honored with a base named after them. Do you still do you still think about like oh who oh, should we yeah I, oh I certainly do but I I don't want to go into that because I'm uh, that's something that we're deliberating as part of the commission so I don't feel comfortable doing that I did write an article uh, that you're welcome to look at in the Washington Post in June of 20 where I came up with 11 names mm -hmm. uh, to do that and if you gave me an hour I could come up with another 11 and if you gave me an hour after that I could come up with another 11 there's so many so and this is soldiers because it's an army issue really there's so many soldiers that serve the nation with honor that served this country in, in the uniform of the U.S. Army, uh, we have, and I know you could tell them, uh, whether it's from this battlefield or from Incheon or from, uh, from Da Nang or from uh, uh, anywhere, that, or from Fallujah or, um, uh, or you know, Cop Keating, you could name anywhere. There are so many soldiers uh, that, that as, as Lincoln said, gave a last full measure of devotion or any other way that you want to look at it. So I'm extraordinarily excited that the Army, which is the most diverse workforce in our country, that we can make sure that those people that we commemorate um, uh, represent the values, courage of the United States Army. And so that, is, that gives me great pride that the nation is going to do it. Remember, this, is, this isn't the Army doing it. It's the nation deciding through its elected representatives to make that change. So I'm, I'm just very, uh, and it was a super majority that overrode President Trump's veto to create that commission and to sign the National Defense Authorization Act of 2021. Does that law also apply to the West Point Military Academy? A anything that's part of DOD. Okay, so it does then. So you end up going to West Point. There we go. Yes. Where you study, or you're, you're a professor of history. Um, I assume you staff rides. You all, bet. All kinds of stuff. And you're confronted with some of the same iconography at West Point that you see at Fort Benning and Fort Bragg. Can you go into that a little bit? And was that uh, at this point, not strange to you, it was, oh, of course. This, this became came strange very quick. I mean, the, 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 then there are a couple things that have changed me before that. One is, is as you've already known, uh, the hero of my book is my wife, Sherry, 
uh, who is the most honest person I know. And I grew up in a culture that lied. It was a lying culture because it was a culture that was based, you know, I lived, I was born into a racial police state, an apartheid state, uh, where, where black people were, um, were relegated to second-class citizens. They couldn't vote. Remember, we've only been a democracy in this nation for about 50 years. Uh, so I grew up with these, with this, with, in that uh, environment. And uh, my wife, just, she's incapable of lying, so she changed me. Um, my, my, my time as an army officer changed me, and then the time as a historian, as a scholar. So we're living on Lee Road by Lee Gate and Lee Housing Area in West Point. Uh, we, I walk, I'm walking one day past our barracks, and our barracks at West Point named after our finest uh, soldiers in American military history. So, uh, I mean, you could argue with them, but, but there's, there's Scott Winfield, there's Scott Barracks, MacArthur, Washington, Eisenhower, Pershing, Sherman, uh, and, and then I go by, and there's Grant, and I go by Grant Hall, and one after Grant Hall is Lee Barracks. And I look at that and I go, damn, you know, why is that here? I mean, I understood Washington Lee University. Sure. Uh, and then I go look east about 20 yards at this new Reconciliation Plaza that has Lee, that was put up in 2001, has Lee as well on that. And I, and I go around Post, uh, Campus Post, looking, and I find over a dozen uh, uh, Memorial Salina went, how the heck does this happen? I said, well, and I asked my boss, who's at the time the memorialization chair, he didn't know, nobody cared. And I said, well, this is like 2007 or eight or something. I said, well, I know how to fix that. So I start going about looking. And what I found, which was so extraordinary, is that, at least I thought at the time, because I didn't start out as a Civil War historian, is in, in, uh, right after the Civil War, I thought, well, they'll probably put this starting this in 1870 when Lee dies. You know, the bond of West Point will bring them together is so important. No. In the 19th century, in fact, West Point banished the Confederates as traitors. None in our cemetery, none on Battle Monument, our great 70-foot monuments. It says the War of the Rebellion. Um, none in our Memorial Hall. Duty, honor, country, our famous motto, 1898. Country, it's an anti-Confederate monument. So then I think, when did this come about? So I go back. I write that up. I put an article. I put a journal article about Civil War memory at West Point. Then I start figuring this stuff out. Well. When's the first come? Lee first comes back in the 1930s. Okay, that's Lee Road, Lee Gate, all these things. Uh, then there's a portrait of Lee in Confederate gray with an enslaved servant in the background, 1951. Then Lee Barracks, early 1970s. Like, what, what? And so I start, you know, context. Well, it turns out the 1930s when the first black cadet comes back to West Point after 50 years. 1951? The Army has, is fighting against desegregating. Truman has ordered it in Executive Order 9981, and the Army is slow rolling it. It's fighting it. Two secretaries of, our, of the Army are from North Carolina. They're slow rolling it. They order, the Second Army orders that portrait. 1971, that is the year after minority admissions start, and West Point goes from a tokenism, a handful of cadets a year, to dozens of cadets a year. So I scratch a Confederate monument at West Point, and it's a reaction to integration. Other Confederate monuments are, 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 to, are to celebrate the white supremacy victory, uh, sort of the redeemer movement of all the southern states that redo their, their state constitutions, like Virginia, which says, of course, I mean, this is what Carter Glass says, of course we're fighting for white supremacy. That's the whole point of redoing the state, state constitutions to ensure that white people have control over black people. This is, this is the different side of the same coin, which is how do you react against integration? Confederate memorialization is one way of doing that. And that just tears me up. And that is what really starts me, uh, so it changes me to, from being just a historian to be, because I'm a historian activist. I think these things should change. And so you're still obviously in the United States military at this time. You do staff rides. And it, it, there's a line in your book that I think really resonated with me. And I think it should resonate with anyone who does battlefield interpretation. You said, quote, don't let the smell of gunpowder overwhelm our senses. What did you mean by that? Yeah, uh, so the, the smell of gunpowder seduced me. So I would get on these battlefields, Antietam, uh, Gettysburg, and I would, I, would, I would talk about the X's and O's of military history. You know, I, I, like, uh, like at the Bloody Lane, um, talking about uh, John Brown Gordon, you know, uh, or, or pick his charge, or, you know, I'm in the peach orchard, and I looked at this, but I didn't start it by saying, here's the purpose of this war and it's not equal. We can't remember, the, the, the two sides are not equal. One side, United States of America fighting to retain this, one side is a slaving army. It's fighting for slavery. It is not only fighting for slavery, it is fighting 
and, and I, I think that's the thing that I, I, you know, I bring this up right now, which is remember that Lee's army, when it comes to Gettysburg, is not only, it is slaving, enslaving people. And, and, and so it's it, logistics is slavery. It is an enslaved logistics, 8,000 that are coming, following him into Gettysburg. And that, and he wants more. Gosh, Jefferson Davis, or uh, 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 Seddon's, get me more enslaved labor. Get me more enslaved labor so I can put more of the white men fighting. That's his, that's what he's doing. And then when he comes here, he, he scatters the black population of Harrisburg and everywhere else because everywhere his army goes, they capture black people to bring them back for south for sale. So this is, an, in my opinion, this is an evil army doing evil things for an evil purpose. And if, if I let, uh, if I only look at the, the military history part of the X's and O's, I lose that fundamental difference between the side that, the blue side that I wore, the United States of America, and the enemy. Yeah, no, I think this relates to that. In your book, you go into some detail about the importance of names and what we call things. And so, for example, you won't use the term, or you don't like to use the term, Union soldiers, which we use at Gettysburg all the time. I mean, the museum, the waysides, that's how we refer to the United States Army that fought here. Uh, go into a little bit about what you find problematic with that. Yeah, I, well, I, I, so when I'm at West Point and I go into the cemetery, I've never seen the word Union on a tombstone. Never seen the word Union on any of the plaques in Cullum Hall. Below, you know, that we have this, this amazing ballroom that has all the uh, portraits of the Civil War generals, the U.S. Army Civil War generals, and they look down on you in this great ballroom. In fact, that ballroom is where uh, Sherry's father met Sherry's mother. He's from uh, going to West Point. She's from Queens. They meet at a hop at a dance there and, and marry four years later. Uh, and so in, in that ballroom, they, these portraits look down on you like, if not for the United States Army, there would be no United States of America. And as I'm looking at that, I realize this union term does not describe the people wearing the same blue uniform that I do. It makes it seem as though it's, a, it's an army, uh, as, Mar as Karl Marx would say, in the dustbin of history. That it's, it fought only one war, and it never fought another war. No, that's the United States Army that fought the same blue uniform with the same buttons that I wore on my dress uniform for 35, 35 years, eight months, and a day. It's the same one that George Washington wore. And by saying Union, you miss that fundamental difference that this is the United States Army, my army, and you miss the idea that Confederates are killing U.S. Army soldiers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so it, to me, there's, you've got to keep that fundamental difference. And I will tell this again and again. I am a soldier. I'm a scholar, but I'm also a soldier. I'm a United States Army soldier. It's what I did for the majority of my life. I will always be a soldier for life is what we call it uh, in the Army, a soldier for life. And as a soldier for life, I like people that fight for the United States of America, not those who fight against it. In 2017, you're invited back to Washington and Lee to give a speech, a talk. And this is, you at a point in time where there's been you know, significant racial strife, violent racial strife in the United States. 2015, obviously, <laughs> in Charleston. Uh, you're invited back to Washington and Lee, though. And you go back to the Lee Chapel, and you give um you give a speech. Can you go into that? Cause to me, that's kind of a, I don't know if that's a cathartic moment, but if, I would imagine for you professionally to be back in that building and to give the talk that you gave must have been an extraordinary moment. It, it was. Um, it was. Uh, you know, I, I, a friend of mine, uh, Ted Delaney, who, uh, amazing guy, he was, uh, uh, started out at West Point, I mean, started out at w as a as a janitor as a, a, a custodian there, grew up, and it's a black man, grew up segregated uh, Virginia, started as a custodian, 20 years later he graduates from WNL. Then he finally goes, gets his PhD, comes back, and is now the senior, sort of the, the professor, the moral conscious of, West, of, of uh, WNL. And he invites me to come. He knows, he's seen my, that, we've talked, and it's a month after Charlottesville, and I give a talk called Robert E. Lee and Me. And I was, uh, as we say in the military, nervous in the service. Uh, nervous in the service, because I had to tell my truth. Uh, my truth is that I think Robert E. Lee chose treason to preserve slavery. Uh, and so I, I give this talk standing on top of his grave um, with this uh, framing me in the background. And, and, I, and I say this. I say that, that he chose uh, treason to preserve slavery. And I, I really call on my school, the school WNL, which I, you know, I'm, I'm a proud graduate, that they have to embrace this. They have to figure out 
how they're going to change from a school that embraced a lost cause to one that is going to not no longer do that. And so I tell this story, and um, there are flaggers in the back, in, the, in there. Flaggers are, if you know flaggers, they're the ones, uh, neo-Confederates who, uh, um, who believe that you should, that the Confederate flag should be everywhere. They, and around Lexington, they put these 90-foot flagpoles around, and they wear their red pants. So they're in the uh, background, and, and it was scary because this was right after Charlottesville. Um, but what I found is when I told this, and when I told my, and I told my story first, I didn't just say, hey, you, you're, all, you're, you know, you're all screwed up. I said, here's me, I did this. Mm -hmm but this is not right anymore. And I, I was worried, you know, it's an almost white audience. What was the reaction gave? And I, and I was amazed they gave me a standing ovation. At WNL, at Washington and Lee, in the Shrine of the South, standing over his tomb. And when I, before I finished the other story, is I said, people were really uncomfortable. And I said, I hear you, you're uncomfortable. Uh, uncomfortable causes no lasting damage. In fact, uncomfortable is called education. That's what it is. And, and I look back and I, I stop, go back and I look and say, look, He's still there, no, no damage, it didn't crack. I wasn't swallowed whole into the ground. There was no lightning that struck me. Uncomfortable is okay, you're okay to be uncomfortable. But imagine, if you will, which you should, what it was like in the enslaved era, knowing that your parents, grandparents, great-grandparents were going into enslavement, knowing that rape was a part of that culture, uh, knowing uh, the pain and suffering of the segregated era. I said just hearing the fact that Lee was a traitor for slavery, that's uncomfortable, but it's nothing. You can handle it. Americans can handle it, and we'll be a better, more empathetic people if we come to grips with that. Before we turn it over um, to the audience for questions, I do want to end at uh, the same spot that you end the book, which is with a quote. Uh, it's the very last line in your book. Uh, and you say, the only way to prevent a racist future is to first understand our racist past. When you think about where the country was in 2015, when you did the PragerU talk, or if you think about where the country was in 2017, when you spoke at Washington Lee, and you look at where we are now in 2022, do you think we're evolving or devolving? Are we on the right trajectory? Are you encouraged or are you discouraged about the yes. progress? <laughs> Why don't you tell yes, story? I'll, tell, I'll, tell, I'll tell you a story. Uh, <laughs> so yes, I'm encouraged. The idea, and I was, uh, Sherry and I went to Richmond recently, and we went and looked at Monument Avenue, all gone. We went and looked at the United Daughters of the Confederacy headquarters. Anybody know, have anybody ever been to Richmond and know where the United Daughters of the Confederacy headquarters? Right above that, and there's, a, there's the Robert E. Lee camp of the, Uni of the Sons of Confederate Veterans, a little plaque right there, and looking right above that is Rumor of War, which is this, um, a statue that looks like the Jeb Stewart statue, horse reared back like this, except it's a black man in a hoodie with dreadlocks, Nikes, and torn jeans. This heroic portrait of a black man, and it dominates the UDC headquarters. And then we went into what was the Museum of the Confederacy, now the Civil War, American Civil War Museum, and it's telling a completely honest story. Then we go into what was the Virginia Historical Society, and they had, that's where the Lost Cause painting is. That's, that's, that's Lee and Jackson before, right before Chancellorsville. Massive portrait, you know, and, and it says this is a Lost Cause portrait. So it had completely changed. And we went down by, I think, Brown Island maybe, where we saw the Emancipation and Freedom Monument, which, which shows a proud, um, formerly enslaved woman with her baby here holding up the Emancipation Proclamation and a, and a formerly enslaved man, chains following with whip marks on his back. And I thought, oh my gosh, this is fantastic. And then I see others, and for those teachers in the audience, how confusing it must be to be a, a, a teacher right now, worried about states passing laws about what you can teach. Mm -hmm. History is dangerous. History is dangerous because it goes after our myths and our identities. But to quote John Updike, the truth is ruthless. The truth is ruthless. Uh, and, and the writer's job is to sometimes rub humanity's face in the facts. So I know that's what I'm doing sometimes, but I do believe, I believe in the promise of America. I do believe in this country. I believe, uh, I, I believe that patriotism uh, comes in, in criticizing. James Baldwin once said that, that I love my country more than any other, and for that reason, I, 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 I will criticize her relentlessly. So I love my country, so I'll criticize. So in, on the one hand, things, things, yes, amazing, getting better. On the other hand, uh-oh, watch out. We're Americans. That, that's the story of America. But I know that, that, with, with, that people doing the right thing and understanding their history will make us a better, more empathetic people. And I do go back to that. If we want to ensure that we don't have a racist future, the best way to do that is to understand our racist past.
Ladies and gentlemen, join me in thanking Dr. Kaiser. Thank we do have a few minutes for questions. Absolutely. Absolutely. Questions? Uh, sir. Yeah, great question. So the, the United Daughters of the Confederacy, probably one of the most successful propaganda uh, machines in the history of the country. Uh, incredibly powerful. They created, which is still around today, the Children of the Confederacy, which was founded in Alexandria, Virginia. And they, they, you can look online and find the, the Confederate Catechism, which the United Daughters of the Confederacy still to this day have children memorized uh, to win scholarship money. And that is the Civil War wasn't about slavery. Uh, states were, it was about states' rights, slaves were happy in their condition, all those things that were, you know, written in the 1920s, 1930s. Um, so they are, the, and I saw them around. I was not a member of the, the Children of the Confederacy, but if you, everywhere you go in the South, and in fact, on this battlefield, oh my gosh, how many United Daughters of the Confederacy monuments are here? A, a bunch, because I went, Sherry and I went and saw them. Uh, Alabama uh, says that. Um, North, Carolina North Carolina says that. Uh, so, yes, it, it, the United Arts of Confederacy is in our DNA at this point, and I don't, it, and it will take a heck of a lot of work to get it out. Yes. Well, uh, uh, I was, so frankly, I had been through this with the superintendents at West Point, three-star generals, and they were a lot more scary. <laughs> <laughs> Can I get to that? Yeah. Because I'll tell the truth. <laughs> <laughs> I'm more nervous than I've ever seen him in 35 years to a war to shut down the Vietnam. That was me. That's the most nervous I have ever seen him and more preparation than I have ever seen him go through. And that is saying a lot because it's 35 years to a war. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Damn, I can't get, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, this is true. I tell you, I grew up lying. It lies in my DNA, and, and sometimes it's still hard to get out. So luckily, I have these other truth meters over here uh, to tell the truth when I sometimes fail. So it's true. It's true. It's completely true. No, I mean, I worked the heck out on that speech. I worked it hard to make sure that I was going after Lee and not going after w &L. Uh, but but I talked about all the times that that I mean I went through and did this did the research I really wasn't ready to, the, the book goes much more into Lee than I did there because I hadn't gone in that it was telling my story and then but then telling tra traitor 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 and that's what that's what West Point did West Point what I realized in the 19th century is treason remember Article Three Section Three of the Constitution there's only one crime in the Constitution and that is treason is levying war against the United States and 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 he had to have two witnesses. It's meant to narrow the definition and not political speech. But did, if anybody, again, he was indicted, Lee was indicted, not convicted. But so, I, I mean, saying that there was, was, was really nerve. I, I was nervous. I was. And I, I think I hit it, but it was, I was totally nervous to call Lee a traitor to slavery there, standing on top of his grave. It was, it was, it was nerve wracking. But I had to tell my truth, too. <laughs> Thank you. I mean, his army is crushed, destroyed, wiped off the battlefield. Um, uh, I, the first thing I do is to say, the first thing you got to do when remembering about Lee as a commander is it's an enslaving army for an enslaved purpose, all of these things. And then I say he's a first rate commander. Um, uh, but the war, you know, one of the, I mean, Gary Gallagher says this, which is he's this great uh, emeritus professor at UVA that says, you know, the, the most, the, what is the turning point? So, you know, we always talk about that. He has a great way of saying it's the Seven Days Battle. So when Lee takes over, and McClellan is five miles from Richmond, he takes over and kicks McClellan out. If, if that doesn't happen, you know, they could take Richmond, the war is over, slavery still a thing. So, you know, with that, and that, he, 
that fishermen there really lead to the, that's what leads to the Emancipation Proclamation. It's already happening in Antietam. In seven days, it leads to the Emancipation Proclamation, which overturns the war. And, and he's defeated commander after commander after commander. And, and listen, you, you can say that they're all terrible, but most Civil War commanders are terrible. <laughs> most of them are terrible. I mean, it's really hard after you've been leading this many people to lead this many people. And he defeats Pope McClellan, uh, 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 what was it? Hooker, <laughs> Burnside. I mean, we can name them all. And so he gets to the, but, but I will say, but then I say, Grant's better. Grant is the finest soldier to ever wear the U.S. Army's boots. And, and Grant is a fine, is the best commander of the war. He sees at the, at the political, strategic, operational, tactical, that in a way, and I don't know any other soldier in our history does other than Grant. So I, I look at this, but, but the purpose, we, all, we can't remember, we can't forget the purpose of this war is to, is, is treason for slavery. It is an evil purpose and nefarious purpose that he is fighting this war, and that always has to come out first. Uh, well, you know, mixed. Um, so I, I'm writing. I'm gonna write my next book on uh, uh, on a period in the early '70s. So I, I, you know, I, I'm a Civil War historian. I, I do it, but I, I come at it from West Point. So I really been writing and teaching about West Point for years. And there was an incident in the 1970s where um, Nixon comes to West Point and orders. And I talk about it a little bit in the book where he, he orders a Confederate monument to be put on West Point. And when Black cadets find out about this, they write a manifesto and they defeat the president. But what also happens during that time in the early '70s is the army. The military in general recognizes that it has a problem with systemic racism. It, it, it says we have systemic racism in the army, and it's from the four-star generals down to the lowest privates. But it's really black activism that brings it up, and white generals say we got a problem, and there's no way we're going to be able to fight again after Vietnam unless we fix our racist problem. And so they create a whole system of race relations training, a race relations institute, and what becomes an equal opportunity um, uh, infrastructure throughout the entire military. It's there to this day. It is the first institution in the world that, de that, that admits it has a problem with systemic racism and creates a systemic solution. Now, we're Americans, and we have racism that's in our DNA, so I'm not saying that it solves the problem, but it is an attempt, and we continue to work at these attempts to do that. Um, so do we still have a problem with racism? We're Americans. We still have a problem with it. Uh, we have a problem that we don't have enough senior leaders that are uh, – Diversity among senior leaders is terrible. But I probably, if I had to say what is the bigger problem in the, in the military, it's gender. Um, and the level of sexism is, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a good subject for a different time, but, but that is an even bigger issue uh, within the Army. But it's working on, I talked to Chief of Staff of the Army uh, last year, and he understands the problem that we have with race, and is, and is, and is really through his, through, uh, if you see, um, right now we have a black superintendent at West Point and at the Air Force Academy, VMI has one not in the federal government, um, but at 10th Mountain Division, which is up near us, as a, as a black command lieutenant. So w that's how I look at it. What, what's the leadership look like? Um, and that, that, is a, a, that is a more work needs to be done. Hmm. Uh, let's see. Sir, wait, right there. Yes, sir. So, you know, I think that you can, uh, well, yes and no. Certainly, the Congress says it's treason. And there are, um, so if you read, the, which I have, the, um, the congressional testimony uh, through there, they are saying, is, so if you say, is it levying war? I think that's how you have to say, is this levying, that's what the constitutional de definition is. And I don't, even if it's a rebellion, I don't see how you can say it's not levying war. If this is war, it's war. Um, now, uh, and plus, if you think about uh, the Senate during this time, and I looked at the testimony about West Point, and uh, one senator, or I don't know if it was James Lane, I'm not sure which one, says on the floor of the Senate when they, they talk about closing West Point in 1861, says West Point, if the, if the Union is to die, it would be because of West Point post-slaveryism. They said that West Point has more traitors in its midst than any institution since Judas Iscariot. <laughs> so treason, treason, treason. They all say it during that time. So the idea that I'm saying is treason is not something that is a present tense argument. It's something that they everyone was saying 
uh, throughout that period. So, no, I don't think that just because Lincoln said it's a rebellion, um, and remember, Lee is indicted for treason, as is Jefferson Davis and about 20 others. Um, and and it's a lot, there's a great book called uh, Lee's Lost Indictment by a friend of mine, John Reed, that goes into why it wasn't done. But, uh, but no, I, I still think from this soldier's, and I often it's from a soldier's perspective, I think that it fits the constitutional definition of treason. We have time for one more. I saw your hand, sir. Great question. Um, so, I, you know, it, it is interesting, and I think this is an example. The, the interesting one, let's start not here, but at, uh, at Manassas. Um, so, first of all, Manassas is called Manassas. It should be called Bull Run. I mean, Manassas is the Confederate name, and that and the state of Virginia, when this was created, we named it after that. Uh, and then there is Jack Jackson. The steroidal Jackson. Uh, on, <laughs> on the Manassas battlefield and on the bull run. I'm not going to call it Manassas. On the bull run, back, has anybody seen Jack Jackson? Uh, I mean, he's, he, looked, he looked like George Anderson. And it was put there by the state of Virginia in 1940. It's clearly lost track. There's some at Shiloh that are lost track. There are some on this battlefield that are clearly lost track. I had a student that went and looked at the North Carolina and Virginia monuments here, went and read the, uh, the speeches. It's total lost cause white supremacist stuff when they were put in. Absolutely. Um, uh, so what does that mean? Well, if I went and did the thing, there's nothing that puts this in context on those battlefields. Not a darn word puts in context that these were done for lost cause, you know, that the speeches were about lost cause. Uh, that, you know, that, that uh, it was done during a time of lynching, of, of disenfranchisement, of all the other things that, that had this. The interesting thing about the battlefield is that these have, battlefields have become American sacred space. They are sacred in a way that even the Capitol is. I mean, we just removed Robert E. Lee from the Capitol, uh, from the, 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 the Statuary Hall. Yet Alexander Stevens is still there. Uh, Jefferson Davis is still there. So I wish, if it were up to me, there should be a commission, like the one I'm on for this, there should be a National Park Service or Department of Interior Commission that should look at this issue uh, in a holistic way and come up with it. So for instance, I was just at the Robert E. Lee Memorial. Anybody know where the Robert E. Lee Memorial is? That's Arlington. Arlington House is called the Robert E. Lee Memorial. When was it named? 1955. Reaction to Brown versus the Board of Education. So, so you know, we've got to be honest about these things. And we're not, to me, there isn't an honesty because there isn't an understanding. I have never been to another battlefield that had the same level of, that made things equal that this battlefield does. It's as though blue and gray are equal. And to me, they are fundamentally, especially in Pennsylvania, fundamentally unequal. And what that means in the future, I, I don't know. I, I don't know if I've said enough, but how has this become sacred ground? And what should we do about that so that we under, have a more fundamental understanding? So we understand that the UDC put up the Alabama and the uh, uh, North Carolina and what that means and why they did it. Remember that the lost cause has a purpose. Confederate monuments, lost cause ideology, uh, new constitutions, disenfranchisement, black, uh, white terrorists and lynchings are the pillars of a racial slave state, an apartheid state that was, that was created in the South in the early part of the uh, 19, late part of the 19th, early part of the 20th century to ensure white political power at the expense of black power. That's what we got to know. So I will make a couple plugs. One, I hope you can join us again tomorrow at 1.30 for the next installment of the Winter Lecture Series. I will say Robert E. Lee and Me is available in the Park Bookstore. Uh, it's also available on Audible, which I just found out. Audio. And, and you know, I tell you, I great narrator. To the, uh, narrator. <laughs> yes, great there narrator. Well. It's, I, I did the narrator. Yes, <laughs> very good. <laughs> <laughs>